Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Woldermuth. Sorry I've been gone for a couple of weeks and I haven't been making videos. I've been doing some conferences. I've been at CodeMash, TechBash, as well as the Atlanta DevCon. Hope you missed me. Before we get started, I just want to do a quick plug for my ASP.NET architecture course coming up on November 11th. This is the same course I gave earlier this month to a good group of students. Go look at the course and see if you're interested. I hope to see you there. If you're like me and as you're working on different projects, writing unit tests or integration tests can be sort of a task in mocking. We've done a lot of work to be able to make fake versions in order to do our unit tests and in some ways our integration tests, but sometimes that's just not good enough. One of the ways we can get around this is to use containers during our tests. This can be a little confusing to set up and there can be a lot of manual work. But luckily, there is a solution, test containers. I recently became a Docker captain. That's sort of Docker's version of the Microsoft MVP. Because of that, I'm going to be doing more and more Docker content, but it's going to be still in the same vein as it relates to ASP.NET development and client-side JavaScript and TypeScript. Let's take a look at test containers. So I'm starting from a very simple project here in Visual Studio, though you could be using any of the IDEs out there. And I have a test project to do some simple tests against our API. The nature of these tests is completely using mock, though you could be using other mocking frameworks, certainly. This is where I'm mocking up a repository based on some data, setting up some methods of the iBook repository so we can return data for our testing, doing some setup and et cetera. This is all mock stuff. And then I'm returning the iBook repository that's really a mock of that book repository. And this way, later on, we can go ahead and get the book repository and execute. And this all, it runs really fast, but doing all this setup, especially if I have a complex system with a lot of data, can really be a headache. Now for unit tests, this is the preferred way to do it because you want lots and lots of small units and you should be just testing the logic inside of those components or units, if you want to think about it in that way. And so I wouldn't use this method for everything, but sometimes when you want to build build something larger and do tests, especially integration or end-to-end -end tests, using repositories is a really good way to get there. So let's talk about that. Let's first open up the Magic Test Explorer. I could do this at the command line, and I'm going to run all the tests. There's only four. Let's see how fast I can do it. I'm not going to do any cuts during this, just so you can see the real time. And there we had them done really quickly. They say it's 203 milliseconds for the actual tests. There is some startup and tear down, but 281 milliseconds here, 203. I'm not sure which is exactly accurate, but you can get a sense. These are running really, really fast. But what if we wanted to, instead of doing all this mock work, we wanted instead to use containers. Now we could open up Docker. We could, let's say, take a Postgres container. We can run it. We can fill it full of data and just leave it running all the time. But of course, that's going to make it a complete headache when you actually need to run tests, let's say, in a CI CD pipeline. So in GitHub Actions or something similar. And so you don't really want to ha have the state of the running machine not be known by the actual tests. And that's where test containers can really help. So let's start in our test project. You can see it's just the test class and the CS proj. And I'm just going to use this to say .NET add package. And I'm going to get the test containers. Whoops test containers dot ms sql ms sql is because i'm going to be using a microsoft sql container to do our testing if you're using another database or your tests involve other things like redis or rabbitmq or others there are also packages for those different kinds of containers now that it's done, let's hide that. And we're going to want to use the actual containers to do this. So let's first, we're going to use a constructor here. And I'm just going to say container equals MS SQL builder. This is a class from that package. And I'm going to create a new builder. And I'm just going to say build. Now, the way this works is this SQL server builder dot build will generate a container object that we'll use in a couple of different places. There are other options here to actually specify different things that you want to do how it fires up, how to do cleanup, all of that sort of thing. We're going to take this really simply, and I'm just going to use control period to generate a field for me because I'm going to need that in at least one place. This is not starting or stopping the container. It's just setting it up so that you can use it during the process of running this test. And we can see that we're registering the service to get our service collection by calling the static method, and the static method does all that mock work. And so we're going to comment out all the work that it's doing in here. We're going to do it a little, hopefully, simpler. 
We're first going to create a a new collection called new service collection. And this is because we're gonna to need to set up what is inside the service collection, just like you would do in the startup of an ASP.NET Core project. And we're gonna to want to register a new iConfiguration object. So we're gonna say collection.add transient, and I'm gonna have it build an iConfiguration, that special interface from Microsoft Extensions configuration that contains configuration information. We're gonna use a Lambda to set this up. Now I'm using the underscore here to say disregard or discard whatever's being passed in because I don't really care. And I'm gonna first create my configurations. And this is a little trick I learned for testing. I might wanna set a configuration that it isn't actually stored anywhere. I might want it simply in code. And we need a connection string to the database server, so we're gonna do that here. And all we need is a new list of key value pair, and each of these pairs is a string to a string. We'll see in a minute how we're gonna use that to build up our iConfiguration object. Because we're gonna use collection initializers, we just need to create a new key value pair, but we don't need this because it'll infer that. And this is gonna be connection strings, just like if we were doing it in the JSON file. And we're gonna call this our address book DB. That's actually what we call it in other places. And then use a comma, and I'm going to use that container object, and I'm going to tell it get my, a connection string. Now, this is interesting. The idea here is specifically that the container, when it starts up, will know a connection string to get at that actual container. Because of that, you don't have to sort of craft what the connection string will be. You're creating the connection string when you create the container here, and then the container is going to give you a connection string to that new container instance. Now notice that the container is complaining and that's because I had this as a static method. I'm just going to create it as an instance because obviously we need to get at the container object. Now that we have that, we're just going to need to return the I configuration. And how do we do that? We say return new configuration builder, add in memory collection. And what are we going to do? We're going to add that configs. And then we're going to say build. And so now we can see that we have this very simple way to create the configuration. And we're going to need to do some other set Setups here. Because we're not doing the convoluted mocking, we actually need to go ahead and add the other services, which is collection.add db context. Then we're going to use the book context, which is a context object in my project. And we're also going to say add transient for i book book repository and book repository. Now this line is interesting because this is the same book repository we use for the rest of our project. But because we're adding a context that can reach our SQL server, right? None of this needs to be mocked. Oh yeah, I always make this mistake. This type is wrong. This actually has to be string to nullable string. There we go. That's nice and cleaner. So I'm gonna actually add another transient to book entry faker, which is the way I'm getting our sample data and I need a transient for address. Faker. I'm using the bogus package to generate some sample data so our app works. I don't actually have a data store for that. So this may be that you need to launch a container of your own making with that data, or in my case, I'm just using these fakers, but you can get a sense of what we're doing. And finally, I'm going to return our collection here and return our collection by saying build service provider. Because remember what we're actually getting here is that service provider. Let's go ahead and initialize this in here services equal register services. Now it feels like we've done everything that's required. You'll see that the actual tests get that uh, interface with the book repository, go ahead and do the work and do the tests. And finally, let's just call container dot start async. And so let's just call start async wait and let's just see what happens, right? Let's start our tests. And we're noticing that this is taking a lot longer. So let's go down so we can really see what is happening here. Most likely this is failing because that database isn't actually generated. I think we're, they're waiting for a 30 second timeout. Let's go and look at these test containers. You can see them slowly coming up and there are a number of them for it to manage it. So here's all those SQL servers that it's trying to reach. And then eventually it's going to complain that it failed. And of course it failed because it couldn't find book entries. There's nothing in the database. It eventually worked, but it worked in 43 seconds, not 200 milliseconds. We need to have a better way to do this startup. And in 
addition, we need to be able to update the database. So let's cut that out and let's add an interface. And this is specific to X unit, which is what I usually use. And unit will have the same idea here, but I'm just going to tell the test that it has an async lifetime, just an interface. And if we implement the interface, I'm going to move these to the top so we can see where the real meat is. You'll notice it has an asynchronous initialize and an asynchronous dispose. And we're going to use those by starting our container. And this way it knows that the container has to complete before. So we'll go ahead and make this async so we can actually do that. And when the test is over, we can say await container dot stop async. So the container comes down. And that's an important idea here is that you're just bringing up the container, running your test and bring it down. You're not going to end up having a long term container. When we start this, we're actually going to need to do a couple of things. And when we start this, once it's completed, we need to get that data in. And so what I want to be able to do is say context.database.ensure created. Now I have the data being pushed in as part of a migration and so ensure created should work, but we need to get that context object and we can get that by calling on our lovely services and we can just say get required service required so that it throws an exception if it doesn't find it because we put it in there, we know it's there. And I'll go ahead and get that book context. Once I have that, I should be able to do ensure created. And in fact, just to be safe, I'm gonna say await ensure created async. So let's run all the tests. 56 seconds, not fast. Now what's happening here, which may not be obvious, is it's recreating that database in the container for each one of these. That's why if we look at these, it looks like our actual duration of our test is really quick. The actual running of the code, getting of the data, but it's all that setup time that is causing us to have the complete run take that long. In case you don't know this about XUnit, though I suspect NUnit is similar or other frameworks, for each test, which we have four, it's going to initiate a a new instance of this. What happens in that new instance? We're creating the container, we're starting it, we're executing the data fill, and then we're stopping it at the end. Like for a large process, using a real container is going to not be the option. So if you have a thousand tests and you run it like this, this is not going to be happy. But luckily, you could be using instead of a container, you could be using something like SQLite, though. Getting your MS SQL or your Postgres databases to run inside of SQLite, there's some problems there. You might also think, what about the in-memory database provider for Entity Framework? And specifically, Microsoft doesn't suggest this, and it doesn't suggest this because there's a bunch of things about the in-memory database that isn't actually relational, and so it's not guaranteed to work in the same way. If I were to run this very simple example with it, it probably would be fine, but as soon as this test get more and more elaborate, it's likely to fail for some very weird reasons. One of the biggest reasons I found with a client recently is that what it does is it caches the service collection every time we run this. Since we run into this error very quickly saying too many instances of the service collection and we had to sort of find that it was happening inside of the in-memory database. So we've abandoned it and gone to this approach. But how do we solve this and make it a little better? We might want to only run this once per class and it may be only relevant to the tests that are using that database. So it might be a much smaller segment, let's say the integration tests of your project. The way we do this is I'm going to add a new class here and I'm going to call it a database fixture. This is the nomenclature from XUnit, so it might be different in your test framework. This fixture is going to derive from I async lifetime as well for the very same reason, is we want to be able to create and dispose. And then in this constructor, you're going to be surprised, but it's pretty much the same thing that is in here, right? We're going to take all the data that we're doing here for register services. This should become a little clearer. We're going to put that into the constructor we're going to also grab the services and the container because those are now going to live in our fixture. And it'll make sense once we get there why we're doing all this. And so we're going to create that container just like we did before. And here we're just going to set our services equals build that container. Obviously, we can't return that. And then just like we did before, in fact, I can just copy these. I'm going to take them out of here anyway. Is we can do the same work we're going to do in starting a container, getting required service, making sure it's full, etc. Now, in our case, we're going to want to make this services collection public. And the reason for that is back in our test, instead of having async lifetime, what we're going to actually do is say class fixture and then give it the fixture name, our database fixture, right? So what's interesting here is this is saying use this fixture once for the entire 
class. Not once per test, which is what we were doing before, but for the entire class. So the startup and teardown are going to be for this entire class of tests. This is actually works at the assembly level, but not until X unit three. So if you want to do it at the assembly level, bring this up for the entire test project. It's possible if you go to the alpha and preview of X unit three or crush something up yourself, but class level is what you're really going to get the benefit of for the most part. So here, instead of our constructor, and we can get rid of all of this because we moved it over, is we're just going to accept the database fixture as an object. I'm actually just going to call it DB for lack of a better word, and I can get rid of both of these members. And so we're really getting down to our classes just being a class full of tests. The only difference is here, we're going to need to use DB to get to our service collection. Let's make all those work. Probably should have did search and replace, but it's over now. So let's go back to our test explorer now that we have the fixture and let's run it again. What? It finished it that fast? It did. The reason is it only had to, it's now at 16 seconds because we only had to do the startup and stop once. And obviously if you have a lot of tests, the tests are going to run without that initialization happening every time. So these tests are still incredibly fast and using the container when it needs to. The test is run and those containers are brought down. These are some other containers that I use. But but for the rest of this, it's starting up the container without you really needing to know anything about Docker in many ways. It's probably useful for you to know more about Docker, and you do need Docker Desktop installed on a Windows machine or your Mac. I believe Linux has Docker pre-installed on most of the distributions, but I'm not a Linux guy, so don't hold me to that. So where does that leave us? I think it's important as we get more and more complex distributed applications that we're going to need to have some ways to do testing that isn't always about mocking up the entire system. This doesn't mean, especially for unit tests, that using a mocking framework to mock up data and other objects and all sorts of different parts of your system so you can do unit tests on small discrete pieces of code. That's going to always be crucial. But when you get into larger sets of testing, like integration tests, you're going to want to be able to run against actual data. In fact, in the next video, I'm actually going to show you how to build up your own container with your own data without ever having a Docker file. That's where some of the magic happens. Again, I thought I would add a quick plug for my Pragmatic Architecture for ASP.NET course coming November 11th. It's a one-day virtual course, 9 to 5, all day. There's a limited number of seats, and early bird pricing is happening now. You get 100 off the full price by registering early. Thanks for joining me. This has been Sean Wildermuth for Coding Shorts.